Hey everyone, it's Beverly Hallberg. Welcome to a special pop-up episode of She Thinks, your favorite podcast from the Independent Women's Forum where we talk with women and sometimes men about the policy issues that impact you and the people you care about most. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. It's coronavirus lockdown day number. What day is it? I think I've lost track. I hope everyone is healthy and hanging in there. I'm Julie Gunlock, the director of the Center for Progress and Innovation at IWS, and I'll be your host for today's pop-up podcast. Today, senior policy analyst Kelsey Bolar and I are going to discuss something that's really quite personal for both of us. It's an issue you might have heard read about in the news lately, the blanket policies being put in place in hospitals across the U.S. that is separating premature babies from their parents. Now, of course, this is because of coronavirus, ostensibly to keep the baby safe from the disease. But as Kelsey mentioned in a recent article she wrote on the issue, these policies come with their own health costs and should be used just as a last resort. Unfortunately, that's that's not happening in some hospitals. Before we delve into this issue, let me tell you a little bit about Kelsey. In addition to being a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, Kelsey is an editor for the newsletter Bright, and she's a contributor to The Federalist. She's also a senior fellow at the Steamboat Institute, as well as being a frequent guest on Fox News. Hey, Kelsey. Hi, Julie. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad you're on. And, you know, I know you and I have talked about this issue in the past because we share something in common. Both of us are NICU moms. We both had babies that had to go to the NICU after being born. Um, And that is a really unique experience. Um, You know, not a lot of people, thankfully, not a lot of people experience it, but it really does bond people when you've been in the NICU. I was uh, my my middle son was in the NICU for ten days, and I knew your baby daughter was there for for quite a while. But tell us a little bit about your pregnancy and the time you and your daughter spent in the NICU. Yes, yeah, so expect the unexpected was an understatement for me. I this was my first pregnancy. I am 30 years old. I am tall and pretty fit, and I just always thought I would rock being pregnant. Like, no problem. I got this. <laughs> right. And right. for 30 weeks, I did rock it. Um, granted, I had horrible, horrible morning sickness that I completely under underestimated. And looking back, I don't know how I even functioned during that time. Um, but Yes, my pregnancy, uh, I found out I was having a a baby girl at 20 weeks and everything was healthy. We were super excited. Um, I I have to say I was doing a lot of travel for work and then uh, around 30 weeks, we, my husband and I went to Bermuda for a baby moon. I returned to Washington, D.C. the next day. I was at work. Uh, At the time, I was working at the Heritage Foundation. I went out to uh, grab a sandwich across the street, and all of a sudden, I felt some water dripping down my leg. Wow. And I was was weirdly calm. I I don't think I believed that it could even be possible that my water broke. Right. And it was just a few drips. And when you're pregnant, they're like, oh, a little bit, a little, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It happens. <laughs> Don't freak out. <laughs> so I was very calm. I was so calm that I actually finished checking out and got my sandwich because I was really hungry. No! <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> On my way uh, back to work, crossing the street, I, I, was, I texted um, someone at work and I called the doctor Um, and it was one of those, uh, message boards where, you know, they'll give me a call back. If it's an emergency, they'll call me back within the next 20 minutes or so. So I walk back to my sandwich, uh, to eat eat my sandwich at Heritage, luckily run into all the right, uh, women, fellow moms. And, uh, as I'm walking in Heritage, just more and more water's coming out and I'm realizing, okay, maybe this is more serious. Um, and by the time I actually went outside with some women to sit down and talk about what was happening and wait for the doctor to call back. Uh, My dress was getting soaked through. Clearly this was real. My water was broken. So, um, but I was still in denial about it. My husband works across the street basically. 
And I uh, told him, hey, uh, my colleague is driving me to the hospital. My water might have just broke. I'm not sure what's going on. Don't worry about coming to the hospital, babe. I'll let you know if it's serious. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <laughs> Julia, I have, said, I, have to, I, have, uh, I have to just interrupt. I have to just interrupt and say, like, when you meet Kelsey, Kelsey is, like, very chill. She's very cool. And I have no, I, it's funny listening to you talk about this because you, you are, you're like very, you're like a very calm, cool person. And it's funny to think I, my, I didn't have a similar situation as this, but I would not have been as cool as you. I would not have been as calm. And I think, you know, it's, it's actually really good because you don't want to spike your blood pressure. You don't want to, you know, have some sort of anxiety attack. And so in some ways it's really great that you were able to stay so calm. I'll let you go on, but I just had to make that note. I think a lot of that is um, ignorance and denial because, <laughs> you know, with my first pregnancy, the thought of giving birth that day was not in the realm of possibility. Right, um, right, right. So uh, I got to the hospital and they confirmed my water was broken. And the doctor, I'll never forget, um, you know, was calmly sitting next to me. It was this kind of young, good-looking male doctor, and he, he said, uh, ma'am, if you have a husband or a significant other, uh, now might be a good time to call them. We're going to move you over to labor and delivery. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> and then my husband took a sweet time getting over because I think he was in denial, <laughs> too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then they moved me to labor and delivery and gave me uh, magnesium is what they, they give you if your water breaks right. early to help speed, um, to help with the baby and it potentially has right. the side effect of uh, preventing labor. They don't totally know that. Um, they gave me a shot to help her lungs develop, which is pretty incredible that something like yeah. that even exists. And yeah. uh, luckily, I, I didn't know if it, I didn't know it was possible that your water could break and you don't have to deliver that day, deliver. but it is. Right. And so I made it 24 hours and then they moved me over to what's called the antipartum room. Uh, and I was posted up there for... I believe it was just over another, it was not quite two two more weeks. Uh, they wanted me right. to make it to 34 weeks because that's when uh, most babies' lungs are developed and uh, babies yeah. do very well. Even if they end up in the NICU after 34 weeks, they, their, their chances of survival are very, very high and their chances of long-term side effects are very, very low. I think the the point when I really got emotional and, um, had my freak out, which was inevitable to come at some point, was was actually when the NICU uh, doctor came to speak with me when I was in that initial 24-hour labor oh. delivery room because um, they, <laughs> yeah, they they knew if I was going to deliver. I mean, no matter what, my baby was going to be in the NICU, and I think that's when it really hit me the gravity of the situation. And I thought, you know, being sort of in the uh, pro-life world. Uh, prior to this, I kind of knew a little bit about premature babies and, and their chances yeah. of survival, but it just didn't fully click that this was happening to me and that my baby might have to fight for her life once she was born. Well, so, <laughs> Yeah, and I think, too, I think, and Kelsey, I mean, you, I'm sure, were enmeshed in this culture, too, is there is a sort of, and I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive of it but there is sort of this like industry of pregnancy and baby dumb and new and like your newborn and how you know there's this idea that it should be ideal and perfect and you should have candles and you should have a playlist and you know like you know I mean I, I even had I bought like a designer hospital um, gown robe thing because I didn't want to wear their ugly colors like I was really into this right and then when this happens <laughs> it sort of destroys this whole, you know, and, and, and look, you have your, now you have your own story, but it, but it does sort of interrupt this sort of idea of what having a baby is supposed to be like and your sort of vision of things. It's a big bump in the road. And so I think to some degree it's hard when you finally understand what's happening, it's hard to kind of come to terms in such a short amount of time. And you've got a short amount of time. I had a similar thing where I had to deliver very quickly and I wasn't really able to sort of understand, absorb what the doctors are telling me. It's just it's very uncertain time and you're worried and you're scared. And, and to some degree, you don't have any choices. It's not like someone asked you, would you like to have the baby now or would you like to wait? <laughs> you just have to have the baby. 
So I think there's also that is just coming coming to terms with how things are just you know it it changes things it really does. So you have absolutely. To- I had drank all the. I, I drank all the Kool Aid and uh, was playing right, on right. attempting the natural birth. Believe it or not, uh, <laughs> that all went down the toilet. And I actually, right. moving forward, if I'm lucky enough to get pregnant again, I will never even be considering a natural birth again. Give me the epidural. <laughs> give me the drugs. They saved me. They saved my baby girl, and I am eternally right. grateful for it. <laughs> well, so you, so let's, so let's get forward. You, um, she, she is delivered. She does then go to the NICU. And let's talk, I want to get to your article too. So let's talk about how important, and again, you know, my child was also in the NICU, and I'll just very quickly say that, and actually I've never, I've never written about it and I've never talked about it, but I wasn't allowed to see my child. I wasn't even allowed, I couldn't even, they didn't even let me see him. I certainly couldn't touch him or hold him, but for 24 hours, I didn't even, I didn't even glance at him because I had some um, some very dangerous health complications right after having him, and then he did as well. He had a respiratory issue, very common after C-sections, for the baby to essentially aspirate his own, like, you know, the, the, the fluid, and that's what he did, and then he developed an infection, blah, blah, blah. But the point was is um, it was it was really horrible for me not to be able to see him for 24 hours, but then, of course, when I did see him, they could barely tear me away, and I'm sure you were the same, and Talk to me a little bit about the importance of a mom. Uh, you you talked about in your article of the the kangaroo uh, cuddles and 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 why skin to skin is so important, particularly from for for newborns or for preemies. And I loved what you said. This heading in your article was Nick, you parents aren't the same. So t- talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, and I don't mean to give us like a gold star and special treatment, sure. but the truth is there are. Uh, there are important differences between NICU parents and any other uh, visitor to a sick patient in the hospital. Um, so, so this is something I learned that uh, when babies, uh, many of them are born premature. I mean, even with a newborn, you know, this skin to skin contact is so important. Um, and there have been so many uh, studies on this that have actually found that skin-to-skin contact kangaroo care has a huge range of uh, health benefits to the point that they actually can help premature uh, babies survive and and thrive. Um, Some of the benefits include stabilizing the baby's heart rate uh, because the heart rate will really sync up to your heart heart rate. The baby's used to um, feeling your heartbeat in the womb. In my case, my baby was still supposed to be inside of me. So uh, her hearing my heartbeat um, by, by laying on my chest is very comforting and calming to her. Um, it, yeah. it also helps improve their breathing pattern, which is a huge issue for babies born premature. Uh, my daughter had to be on a CPAP machine to get breathing help uh, for the yeah. first couple of days after she was born. It helps improve oxygen saturation levels. Um, which which is a big issue. It helps them sleep better. It helps them gain weight uh, quicker. It decreases yeah. crying, and I can speak from experience on that somehow. <laughs> Everything my baby girl Scarlett put me through, uh, she's not a huge crier. Um, it yeah. also helps. Uh, it helps uh, both mothers and babies breastfeed, which is so important and such a challenge for Nikki moms. I'm sure you experience this yeah. too. Um, you know, of course, there's all this pressure to breastfeed and, and yada, 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 but it is so important for NICU babies to have uh, have breast milk because the breast milk is, you know, it's, it's incredible. Loaded. Yeah. Your body somehow yeah. knows that. Uh, your baby was born premature, and your body will produce the exact mix of ingredients that your baby yeah. needs at that time. And if NICUs yeah. are banning mothers from uh, physically being there with their babies, it can be very hard for mothers to produce so that milk. So, so let's talk. Yeah, let's 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 um, let's back up a little bit. So basically, what you wrote about is this new policy in hospitals where um, parents are being essentially banned from seeing their 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 babies that are in the NICU. So they're not being allowed to go in to do what you say, the kangaroo care or the skin skin or even touch them. You know, I went 24 hours without seeing my middle child and it it, it was so traumatic for me 
to give birth to a baby and to not be able to see it for 24 hours. And some of these parents aren't seeing them for a, an extended amount of time. What? Tell me a little bit about the philosophy behind this, why hospitals are doing this, and 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 what kind of reaction there has been from you know parents who who again who who are not able to see their newborn. Yeah, so I I do want to start out by saying this is absolutely not the policy for every NICU across the country. Fortunately, this is only the policy in a handful of NICUs. And actually already, I believe at least in one of those hospitals, they have reversed it. Um, But it's still, uh, from, from, from my research, it still is the case in some hospitals across the country. And, you know, of course, the reason is to protect these tiny uh, vulnerable babies from catching coronavirus. And the thought is right. the more uh, people you can limit coming in and out of the NICU, the less chance that these babies are going to catch coronavirus because some of them are already on uh, machines helping them breathe. Uh, some of them have yeah. very serious health conditions. And I understand the desire to want to uh, protect them uh, in any way possible. But the problem um, and, and the reason why NICU babies and parents are different from any other hospital visitors is because parents, especially moms, are really a treatment for NICU babies. We, we provide this uh, through this kangaroo care and through our, our breast milk, we, uh, we really help these babies survive and thrive. And again, there have been... <laughs> There have been a multitude of studies on all the benefits that mothers provide through kangaroo care that that money really can't buy. No modern medicine can well, provide the benefits that we as mothers can provide to our NICU babies. Well, and the thing is, too, is that, look, this has a low infection rate among children and babies, coronavirus. I think that we, at, you and I wrote a, we actually wrote a joint blog today on, on the, you know, these faulty models. I think you and I both have a lot of sympathy for governors that came down with some pretty hardcore restrictions early on when they saw these models predicting millions dead, mass graves, you know, just an absolute, you know, you know, sort of black death kind of bring out your dead kind of scenarios. I mean, I I think, you know, certainly when you look at the um, the actions of, of Senator Mike DeWine, actually my old boss, I used to work for Mike DeWine for years when he was in the Senate. So for Governor Mike DeWine, you know, he was he was really worried about the models that were predicting this this sort of massive death toll. And but he's actually now, you know, working to 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 open the economy in Ohio back and to roll back some of these policies. And I do think this is also when you look at, you know, and I know these are a limited number of hospitals that are doing this with NICUs, but we're also seeing people who are, you know, dying in hospitals and they're not allowed to see their families. People are dying alone. And one of the, and, and again, I know some of this is, is not, you know, they can't prevent this reality, but it, it's also a reason why we, sh- we, we need to have testing. I mean, we need to be able to test these people and see if they are not infected, then they should be allowed into the hospital and they should be allowed to see these patients and be with the, their loved ones. And, and I think it's the lack of testing, um, which is causing some of what I consider pretty draconian policies, like keeping, um, you know, b- parents away from their babies. The other thing I wanted to and, and notice, and I'm sorry I'm all over the place, but, you know, there's an awful lot of NICU babies who are there. For instance, mine, he was, he was, a, he needed to, they call it eat and grow. I think there's another term for it. But basically, he just needed to get bigger, and so he needed to eat a lot. And babies, you had mentioned, especially babies that are born a little bit early, um, it helps them to to feel good and feel nurtured and to be with their mothers and have that kind of skin-to-skin care so that they can eat a lot because they really need to grow. I'm sure your daughter was born at a very low weight, and she really, really needed to grow. And so that's another benefit to these babies of um of having their their mothers there um and and being sort of with someone who can hold them close right and i i I completely agree with you on testing and i think most americans would be okay with uh, nicu parents falling somewhere towards the top of the food chain for a priority level for some of those rapid response 
tested testing for uh, that they could take before they enter the NICU. But that's the thing. It kind of leads to the larger conversation about how to reopen uh, parts of the economy. Uh, how can we be reasonable in the policies that we're setting forth? And I think when it comes to NICUs, I don't know about your NICU, but the NICU that my daughter was in allowed only two visitors at one time. Yep. So that means I could be there with my husband or I could be there with one of my family members, but we could not have more than two visitors at a time. And right. I, that's very reasonable to me. And I could, I could, as difficult as it, as it would be, I would understand them even uh, in, under these circumstances, limiting uh, that number to one person at a time so that right. there's even fewer. And then also uh, mandating that we are ma- wearing masks and personal protective equipment yeah. when we are walking in and out of there. But, you know, taking this, this the giant leap to just banning anyone, including mothers from the NICU, is just a step way too far, in my opinion, and you have to weigh that with the costs that come with it. Well, you know, we talk about the cost to the child, but the other thing is is that women are very prone to postpartum depression, and this is something that I have known people that has affected. I was never diagnosed, but I can, I kind of look back on my early days, and I had stair step kids. My first two are 18 months apart. My second two are 20 months apart. So there is a span of like six years where I was just pregnant. And then I spent another six (laughs) years with teeny, teeny humans. And I was pretty much, you know, overwhelmed much of that time. And I will tell you that I'm sure that I I sort of probably had moments of, of, of depression. And I will say with my second one who was in the NICU, it was such an incredible stressful time. I also had some health complications because of it. And that 24 hours that I was away from him was just, it was very, very hard on me. I felt tremendous guilt and a whole bunch of just really just a range of feelings. And I'm sure you feel the same way of just, and and it's it's silly, but you do, you feel, um, you just feel so out of control. I also felt very afraid. I know in conversation, uh, afraid to sort of bother anyone in the NICU. And I remember in conversations that we've had, you have similar feelings about, you know, not really understanding, not really wanting, not really knowing what que- you were. You know, it's so, it's also overwhelming and so so confusing that you don't even know enough to ask the right questions. And so, I think we also need to remember that this is also a burden for women. Um, it's a health it, it's a health risk for them that for their mental health not to not to be around their brand new baby. Right. That's actually my biggest fear when it comes to these NICU bans uh, is is, uh, finding out that your baby has to stay in the NICU is one of the most overwhelming experiences you you can ever have. Um, In my case, I had about less than two weeks to mentally prepare for that between the time my water broke and by the time uh, Scarlett arrived. How how long did you have before you found out that your baby was going to be in the NICU? I, the, the babe, uh, my son Henry went into, uh, a respiratory distress as he was, as he was born. And they whisked him away without me seeing him. He was in a, a pretty critical, he could not breathe. And, and then I, uh, subsequently had some problems. So mine was immediate. It was just, I was told after he was born that I wouldn't be able to see him and that he would be in the NICU and he wouldn't be coming home. So for me, it was like, I didn't have any time to prepare. And, it, yeah, it was a real shock. It was, it was really shocking. And then, but then you're in it, you know, you're just in it and you can't, um, it, there's really no time. And even though you had two weeks, it's, it's just not, it's never enough. It's never enough time. If your child's going to be, if you're not going to bring your child home immediately, it's, it's very, very hard, um, to, to a reality to sort of deal with. Right. And, and then you have to figure out how to advocate for yourselves. And I think all of us Nikki parents look can look back at certain moments and, and say, oh, I wish I stood up for myself and said I felt uncomfortable about X, Y, Z. Or I remember one time uh, a nurse accused me of uh, falling asleep in the chair and told me I couldn't hold my baby when I was closing oh. my eyes, having a peaceful moment for her. And it, it's all those moments where you kind of take it as a mother because you don't know yeah. what time, like, this is a whole new situation and, um, and, and looking back, there's so much I would change. And that's why I thought it was so important for us to talk about this on a podcast. So that if uh, anyone knows uh, a mother who is going through this uh, to listen and know that you can and should advocate for yourself in the NICU. I mean, 
especially if you are a parent who is being told you cannot have physical contact with your baby. Oh. Um, at that point, if, if, if that were me, um, I would consider having my uh, baby transported to a different NICU uh, that would allow me to have that skin-to-skin contact because exactly what you said, there's health benefits to the baby and to the mother, and then there's those mental health benefits that are just so, so important. And so um, I, I also wanted to mention uh, that there's actually a petition online. Um, it's it's called Safeguard Family Rights and Rules that Ban Parents from the NICU in COVID-19 Crisis. It was uh, started uh, by the founder of Empowered NICU Parenting. It's uh, uh, empoweredNICUParenting.org. They also have an Instagram, and they're kind of looking at the different hospitals that are banning parents and trying to call them out and advocate for them to change these policies, and they actually had success in helping to reverse one of the policies. So, again, if you know someone who is uh, being told by doctors they are not allowed to physically uh, see their baby, I I would really encourage you to stand up for yourself and uh, try to advocate uh, for a way for that to, to be reversed. Kelsey, I am so happy that you mentioned that, um, and I think this is probably a good place for to wrap up. Although I will tell you that I could probably we could <laughs> I could talk about this for two more hours, and our producer would just stop recording at some point because um, <laughs> he probably has other things to do. But I will tell you, it is it is um, it's such an important topic, and I, you know, it's it's hard. To, it's a little bit hard to talk about these things, but it's it's uh, it's so critical that. New moms understand that that they they can, as you say, stick up for themselves and advocate for themselves and their babies. Um, and and women around, I think during this time, especially pregnant women, need to understand. You know, this is a possibility. Go to your hospital beforehand. Find out what their rules are. Find out what their policies are, um, and and really get a good sense of of what they're going to face. Because I think for you and I, you know, you and me, we didn't we didn't have a lot of time to prepare, but. Um, you know, this is the time to do it if you can find out what your hospital's policies are um, and investigate that a little bit more and advocate for yourself. So, that, Kelsey, thanks so much for ending it on that. I think that's a really important point. Thank you, Julie. Well, we hope you take away something new from today's conversation. And if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks or like the podcast in general, we'd love it, love it if you could take a moment to leave us a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure our message reaches as many Americans as possible. Share this episode and let your friends know that they can find more She Thinks episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here, you're in control. I think, you think, she thinks.